do, Lord. Thank you for today. I thank you, Lord, that there's nothing that compares to you, Lord, and, and there's nothing that compares to that promise I have in you, that promise of eternal life, of salvation, of hope and joy, that there's a future, that my sin is washed clean. Uh, Lord, thank you so much for the gospel. And Lord, I pray today that Jesus is exalted above every other name here, Lord. I pray that Jesus is lifted up highly. Uh, and praised and esteemed and valued, Lord, as people walk away, that they don't walk away just thinking how I can be a better person or a better Christian, but they might just fall deeply in love with Jesus each and every week and each and every day. I pray, Lord, that you'll take the feeble efforts of us that we're, as we do um, this thing we call a church service, but Lord, you take whatever it is that's here today through the song, through the prayers, through the worship, through the sermon, the text here today, my words, and use it all for your glory to transform lives, to bring people into the image of your son, Jesus, uh, that we might see the world saved. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. I'm just kidding. <laughs> so, before we get into this, real quick, okay? If you're busy, you're like, I don't know what I just stepped into. That's okay. We don't either. We just try and love Jesus as best as we can. We're going to be in Luke chapter 4 here today. And we see Jesus. I want you to take that moment, what you thought. This is awkward. I don't, is that the whole sermon? Yeah, that's right. Like, just think what you're thinking there and just hold it. And I'll we'll come back to it later, Okay. I want, you, you need to experience that so you can see how great Jesus is later. But we've been tracking through the book of Leviticus, and we're done with that. Praise the Lord, hallelujah, and everyone came back to church. That's great. Uh, but it was super cool, and we saw how Jesus was the better sacrifice. All these sacrifices in Leviticus point to Jesus, um, and that you have the grain offering, the peace offering, the sin offering, the guilt offering, and the, all of these point to Jesus, and he fulfills all of these, so that's great. I don't have to show up in my cereal every morning and offer it to Jesus. I don't have to show up with my, go to Woolies to get some barbecue and offer it to Jesus for my sin every day. Praise the Lord for that. Uh, but we also see though that there was this, the gospel message throughout Leviticus from leprosy, that Jesus is the one who's making us clean. Uh, we saw, we looked at last week at the Jubilee year. So every 50 years, everything got reset. We had the, the Monopoly game out and that the game Monopoly is trying to steal and rob and well not steal, it's trying to bankrupt your friends and family and Jesus is like, I'm going to bankrupt myself so I can save everyone else. And so last week we talked about the Jubilee, that it was this reset that you got to start over. Those who are down and oppressed and abandoned, uh, in debt, uh, enslaved, all of that got reset and you got to go home. You got your land back, got a new start, a fresh start. And we said last week that Jesus is meant to be the Jubilee. And so today we're going to go to Luke chapter 4 where Jesus claims, I am Jubilee. He doesn't some translations say that in particular, but most translations uh, say what he actually said, but he means I am Jubilee. So that's the title for today, but I thought a better title, because you're like, okay, great, Jesus is Jubilee. This is the better title. When your enemies want to throw you off a cliff. You're like, amen, preacher, brother. I've been there. Uh, no? Just, okay, that's fine. I thought that was a great title, to be honest. That's okay. Title of the year. That's fine. We still got a long way to go in the year. So Luke chapter 4 is going to talk about, we're going to see that Jesus says, I'm the Jubilee, and we end the story where they're like, eh, let's throw you off a cliff. This wild, how do we get from, let's set the captives free, murder the guy. And how do we get in between there and Kevin sitting awkwardly on the corner there? So we're going to look at that as we track through this story of Jesus. And I'm just praying that God has something for this for you. You're here today. He brought you here for a reason. I wonder what it is. So Luke chapter 4 verse 14 starts off by says, And Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. 
right before this, does anyone know what happened? Like, I know you haven't been reading Luke, but he was tempted in the wilderness for 40 days. All right, so Satan takes him up in front of a, the temple, says, all this could be yours. And he says, if you bow down to me, all this could be yours. And he says, hey, you can make bread out of stone just like that. And he doesn't. He quotes back scripture to him. And so he gets done with that. The angels feed him. It says he was a little bit hungry. And he ate his food, gets nourished, and he's ready to go, ready to launch into his ministry. And the very first thing that is recorded, not the first thing that he did, but the first thing that's recorded in this book is he returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. It also mentions that he was in the power of the Spirit when he was tempted in the wilderness there. And I think before we see what he's going to do, he's going to be the jubilee to set the captives free. It's fundamentally important we have to understand that he walked in the power of the Spirit. And one of the things I'm going to challenge with these is, is if Isaiah was jubilee and Luke is saying Jesus is the jubilee, then we are called to be like the jubilee to the world around us. That that call is on us. That I am anointed to go preach the good news to the downcast, the, to the broken heart of the enslaved and the debtors and and we as Christians are called to be the jubilee to the world around us. But it don't work unless we are, have the power of the Spirit going before us. Well, what does that mean? That's a great question. <laughs> I wish I had like a, a flyer that I could just say, what does it mean to be led by the Holy Spirit, to be empowered by the Holy Spirit? That's one of our things here, being empowered by the Holy Spirit so Christ can be exalted. It's not being empowered by the Holy Spirit so I can look cool or do neat things. It's simply for the glory of God, for the exaltation of Christ. And it was fun in our training sessions, fun being a, a weird way to describe it, I guess, but it was interesting to have the conversation in all our training sessions when we had our morning tea training and our welcoming training, our worship training and our, our communion announced, like all the stuff that we're doing. Is what does it mean to be led by the Holy Spirit in your ministry? Have you ever thought about that before? I know for me it's very easy just to do ministry. Like we just have the stuff that we, some, like how, I don't know how I got signed up in the parking lot. I mean, it just kind of happened. And then you show up and you're like, okay, fine, I'll do it. But have we ever thought, what does it mean to be led by the Holy Spirit? To pray into that space. Lord, help me to see someone that I need to talk to today. Show me who I need to talk to. I think, I, I think there's some people in here that just came off the street because I was just like, come on in, come on in. And they're just, I'm like, I've never seen you before. Are you before? Are you before? Great, praise the Lord. And they're like, I don't know what I signed up for today, but I thought it was a marketplace. And well, we got something better. We got Jesus for you. <laughs> yeah, I just, so I want to challenge you that we can look at what does it mean to be sent to, to breathe the good news, but it doesn't mean much if we're going in our own strength, our own flesh, it's going to end in a disaster. Or maybe not disaster, but we'll miss golden opportunities that God is calling us. He was led by the power of the Spirit. And news about him spread throughout the surrounding region. This guy starts getting a name for himself. And he began teaching in the synagogues and was praised by all. So this is what Jesus would do. He'd walk into a town. It'd be Saturday for the Sabbath. And he'd say, hey, do you mind if I uh, am a guest speaker today? I want some stuff I want to share. If someone did that, actually, we have. It was one time, not at this church, another church. A guy walked up and said, hey, can I preach to the church today? And I was like, uh, I don't, dude, I don't know you at all. You could be a Satanist for all I know. Like, I just, <laughs> no, what do you want to talk about? And I was like, oh, I want to talk about how this, this is like, yeah, no, nah, that's a hard no, dude. <laughs> The Book of Mormon doesn't get preached here, okay? <laughs> I was like, fair enough. He's trying, you know? And where was I going with that? Oh, so Jesus here is, he's praised by all. And somehow, they let him do it. This guy builds up this reputation. They're like, oh, Jesus, I have heard good things about this guy. A popular speaker making the circuit. Yeah, come on. What do you want to share for us? And so he does this. And when he came to Nazareth, which was his hometown, that's vitally important for this story here, where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read. So he shows up. He's going he's gonna to read from the Bible. And keep in mind, everywhere he's gone, people are like, this guy's great. I love this guy. Sometimes it's challenging. If you're praised by all, then maybe you're not always challenging people. Now, Jesus is perfect. So I'm not saying he's a bad preacher by any means, okay? There's Jesus and then there's me <laughs> way down here. But if you're only getting 
praise for what you say, then maybe you're not actually challenging people how God wants you to challenge. And we're going to see here, this time, it didn't go so well. People were not as keen to hear what he had to say. So he stood up to read, and the scroll of Isaiah, the prophet, was handed to him, and he unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, the same thing I read earlier to you today, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Now this is wild, okay? Because Jesus is sitting there, he gets up and he reads this, and the prophecy is actually talking about himself, right? I'm not reading this and I'm talking about Kevin as I'm reading that. Now I think that through Jesus, it does apply to me still that he has called, he, the Spirit of the Lord is on me and everyone who believes in him because he anointed me to bring good news to the poor. That's not just Isaiah. It's also Jesus, the climax of that, but also with me in Jesus, he's anointed me to bring good news to the poor. It's not like you'd be like, oh, well, I wasn't anointed like this, so only Jesus can share the gospel. I'm in. I'm in heaven, but everyone else, well, good luck. You didn't exist in Jesus' time. Sorry. Like, this, it's not just about Jesus. But man, this would have been so cool to sit there and see Jesus as he reads his first thing that we're, it's recorded. Public ministry where he's like, I'm the guy. I am the man who's going to save the world. He has sent me to proclaim release to captives. That's literally the Jubilee there. Who are held in captivity, who are indebted to, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free of those who are oppressed and to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. Sorry, I'll go back here. So this is how it ends, that section. To proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. Well, the favorable year of the Lord was Jubilee. That was, that was the best year ever when everyone got to not work for a whole year. Everyone's debt got paid. The car is paid off. Uni is paid off. The, the, the shed you built last week, that's paid off. Praise the Lord. That's a good year. And Jesus is like, I'm here as the favorable year of the Lord. Now we're going to unpack this a little bit for me and you. Look how it starts here with these three things. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. That's present tense. Right now, God's Spirit indwells me and as you go, and as you become the jubilee to the world, you have to know this within you. That as someone who's put your faith in Jesus Christ, the Spirit of the Lord is upon you. That is not a small thing. People in the Old Testament didn't get it all the time. Kind of came and go in certain places. Solomon's writing a proverb, and he's like, gets this download from here. He's like, wow, that's so profound. Put it in. Next one, oh, that, that's pretty sketchy. That doesn't make any sense at all. Not from the Holy Spirit. Let's throw it out, right? So he ends up with like 3,000 of these things. But he, it's not like he could call on it and be like, God, I want that now to do it. But as Christians, the Holy God, Jesus promised he would leave the Holy Spirit with us forever. It's a seal of, it's a, it's, it's, we're sealed in his righteousness that it's a proof of purchase that we're Christians. A lot of us are, I won't say humble, like humble is a good thing. I think some of us are, doubt on ourselves and are so hard on ourselves and we beat up ourselves so much, we don't walk around with a sense of confidence that the Holy Spirit is upon me. Do you? I had a great conversation this week with some people. Two guys showed up at my door. Yeah. It was my day off. Friday, just chilling, chilling like a villain. And this knock, knock, knock on my door. I'm like, oh, it's the post. You go in there. And the guy's like, hello. And I see two guys with a tie. I was like, let's go, dude. Let's go. And they haven't visited in years. Like it's been, I think I'm on the X list. Don't go to that guy's house. We know he didn't got a chance of being saved, right? He's that weird Christian pastor guy. We don't want to talk to him. So these guys show up and I'm not 100% sure Mormons, J-Dub, somewhere there, they're J -Dub, J Jehovah's Witnesses. And I was like, hey, I'm back on the list. And they're like, did you ask to get off the list? I was like, no, please keep me on the list. And I said, look, I want to respect your time. It's most of the time people come and, and I'm not ever going to change into your religion. It's just never going to happen, you know? It's like having seen, seen color and tasted food and then going back to no, no taste buds, all black and white. That ain't ever going to happen. And uh, I said, look, I've been Brethren, I've been Baptist, I've been Church of Christ, I've been Evangelical Free, I've been all these, but I, I'm not going there. You know, that's a whole nother leap. 
And, uh, and so they wanted to have a chat. I was like, great, you want to come and have Eric on? And we're going to chat. I can make your morning tea. We'll stick you around until you get saved, man. Let's do this. And they're like, oh, well, that's why we're here. Do you want to come to our Easter service? I said, actually, we're having an Easter service. Do you want to come to ours? And we had this good little conversation about, and it just came down to what's the fundamental difference is they're doing this because they need to do good works to be saved. I have to do the will of God to be saved. And he said, he literally was like, it stands to reason that God will let the good works go to heaven. I was like, it stands to reason. Hold on. It doesn't, what does the Bible say? It doesn't, you're right. It doesn't stand to reason that I should go to heaven with all my sin. Absolutely not. There's no sense. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says, by grace we have been saved through faith. It's not of ourselves. It's the gift of God. No man can boast. I said, if you get to heaven and you, and you end up making it, you're like, well, Jesus did his work on the cross, but oh man, good thing I went door to door. I did that. Or if you're a Mormon, it was the two-year mission trip overseas. I actually grew up in Utah. Like Mormons are kind of like my friends, you know. They, we, um, so it's kind of fun to talk with them. And I'm like, hey, I've actually lived in Salt Lake. And they're like, what? You lived in the promised land. Why did you come to Australia? Anyway, it doesn't matter. Beside the point. And um, I'm sitting there having this conversation. And it was just fun because I knew they're there. I got this confidence. The Holy Spirit's within me. I don't have all the answers. They'll probably pull out a verse. You've probably been there where you're like, oh, I hope they don't say a verse that I've never heard of or I don't know what they're going to say. You don't have to worry what to say. You have God dwelling within you. And they don't. It's not even a, it's not even a fair fight. It's not a fair conversation. And you say, Jesus, what do you want me to say? And just leave it. Even if you get your words out and you fumble with sharing the good news or being a witness to your community, you don't even have to get it perfectly because God's over that. There's times I make mistakes all the time preaching. If I was worried about being a perfectionist, this is the bad job. You're not going to get it right, but that's great. That means we have to rely on God even more. We should have this confidence. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. I've ended the conversation there with saying, do you guys have assurance? Like, do you know that when you die, you're going to heaven? And one, the oldest said no. The younger one who had like red eyes, like dem demonic of some kind, he was like a bit off and he wouldn't look at me the whole time. Both of them said, no. And I was like, well, I do. I'm 100% sure I'm going to heaven. I've tasted and I've seen. I know Jesus. We have a relationship. I was like, do you want to know today, right now? And they're like, well, we're kind of behind schedule. We got seven other houses to hit. <laughs> and I was like, all right, well, come back. I'll see you again. Anyway, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, and we should, as Christians, be confident, not arrogant. And I did walk away a little bit feeling arrogant. I was like, man, we roasted those guys. And no, I'm not even joking. I pull up the Bible, verse of the day, do not be confident in your own wisdom. <laughs> I was like, all right, Lord, I, all right, I repent. I'm sorry. I was a little bit overconfident. But we should be confident. We have the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. Let's go. Because he anointed me to bring. So past tense, God has anointed you. Would you say that about yourself? I know the word anointed can be kind of weird. Like some people are like, and other people are like, you know, and so it means kind of different things to different people. But basically it just means, hey, God has a calling on your life. He's called you for such a time, for such a purpose. And that should help bring confidence in what we're going on. Now, you may not know what that is, which is awesome, because that means God's going to show you more and more as he goes. But he has called you for such a time as this. At any time in history, of any country in the world, of any parents, any family, he's called you right now. He's anointed you to bring good news to the poor. So the, go that, the good news is what, where we get the word gospel. To bring the gospel to the poor. Not just poor financially, but poor in spirit. And poor financially. The, the gospel goes out in our life. He's, anoint he's called you. I want you to hear. I don't want you to walk away today not knowing you have a calling on your life. So we have the Spirit of the Lord present, anointed from the past. And here we have the purpose for the future. He has sent me. To proclaim, or that word, that word there is evangelize. That's a, a Greek word. I think it's like evangelon. To proclaim release to the captives. Or let's ha evangelize jubilee. That Jesus has come for the good news. 
and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. Now he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the tenant, and sat down. See, I'm just being like Jesus, guys. I'm literally being like Jesus. <laughs> and the eyes of all the people in the synagogue were intently directed at him. This is where I sit down. I, imagine, I didn't look because it would be weird, but I imagine most of y'all were like, what? That's it? The new people are like, oh, this is just a Bible reading. This is what happens. But the people who come, you know, her regular is like, Kevin clearly didn't have a message. <laughs> That's what you think. This is going to be a short service. Great. Praise the Lord. Now, so they're all looking at him, but look at the difference. Because you probably were thinking, go back to what you were thinking. Look at what they thought of Jesus. Not this guy's a crazy man. Now he began to say to them, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. I'll come back to in a second, but look at the response. And all the people were speaking well of him and admiring the gracious words which were coming from his lips. They're all looking at him like, whoa, that guy. Like there's this authority that Jesus has when he speaks. That people are like, wow. We don't know much about Jesus's like the the physicalness of Jesus, the Bible doesn't say, it says some, but not, not like a lot. But one of the things it does say throughout the whole Bible is he has a thunderous voice, like mighty waves crashing on the sea. That Jesus, as he speaks, I just would have, man, if I could have been there and you could just see Jesus, the start of his ministry, he's fairly young, he's about to do all this great stuff, and he's like, I am the Jubilee, I'm, this is why I'm here. I'm going into my calling, the power of the Spirit. We're going to go do this thing. We're going to save the world. And he sits down and everyone's just like silent. And they're like, that guy's pretty good. Jesus demands this authority. He commands it. It's a part of his nature. And what I love about Jesus is that when we look at getting saved, there's two parts that are absolutely essential. One is, does Jesus have the ability to save us? A lot of people died on the cross, okay? He wasn't the only one. Romans were just, you know, it was like doing coffee, just boom, 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 boom. A lot of people died on the cross, but does Jesus have the ability to save us? And we're gonna, you'll see throughout the rest of the Luke, he's like, yeah, he can walk on water, he can heal the lepers, he can do all this crazy stuff. He does have the ability to save sinners. In fact, it's part of what the Pharisees say. Can this guy forgive sins? Yes, he can. But second, it's not just that he has the ability to save us. He also has to have the authority to save us. I might have the ability to be a great singer, but if no one gives me a, the a chance to actually get up there and gives the authority for me to actually do it, it doesn't mean anything. You can have all the potential in the world and never give it a shot. And we see here that Jesus commands authority. He also has the ability. So we'll go back to here. Now, today he began to, saying, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. That's just amazing. I am this. The prophecy has been fulfilled. <laughs> it's like out of like Lord of the Rings or something. The prophecy has been fulfilled in me. And you're like, man, that, that's, that guy's got a lot of courage to say something like that. This guy's a total fruit loop, a crazy man. Or he's being really serious and he really believes this. And so, notice that what they say here, this is, they're admiring him and have gracious words. He's saying to them, hey guys, I'm going to bring in a jubilee year. And everyone's like, that's awesome! Let's go! Imagine what the candidates, we won't talk about that, maybe you're happy, maybe you're sad, doesn't matter, but Let's say the candidates yesterday were like, man, we'll bring a jubilee. You don't have to work for a whole year. All your debts are paid. And everyone's like, let's vote for that guy. This is great. They're all loving this because they get to experience all this grace. They didn't deserve it. Their debt's being paid. They don't deserve the time off. But God's like, I, I'm going to do this. Let's set the captives free. Let's make the blind see. All this grace is going to go out. Now, I know we're at the part of the sermon where you're, you're going to start to be like, Okay, Kevin, we've talked about a lot. Maybe you're feeling challenged. You're processing that, and so you're going to stop paying attention, but I want you to get what's going to happen here. Jesus is like, let's give all this grace out. Dot, dot, dot. And this is the response. Man, he's really great, but is this not Joseph's son? And you see what they do here? They're no longer, it's one thing to have Jesus have all this grace, but they're, 
actually going to question who he is as a person. And this is what the world's going to do to you all the time. People are going to, you may feel anointed by God, have the Holy Spirit riding within you, but then other people will say, aren't you Kathy's son? Oh, we have a Kathy in here. Sorry, Kathy. It wasn't anything personal. I was pulling out a name. Zacchaeus' son. We don't have a Zacchaeus in here, right? Maybe we have some Zacks. Is this not? And so they're literally stripping away his identity. He's not Joseph's son. He's the son of God. I mean, he is Joseph's son, but that's not how he would identify himself. He's like, I am a child of God. I'm the son of God. I've been proclaimed, uh, prepared, called, anointed to go and do this. People are going to see you for who you not really are. One of my it was mind-boggling when I came to Gimpy, my, my first two weeks. I had a, well, a wake-up call. This city cares a lot about family relations, okay? So we're like, oh, this person is this. They're the son and daughter of this person, and their cousins are here, here, and they're connected with these people in the church. And I was like, okay, great. Don't say bad about anybody. <laughs> first day, I was like, wow. And so someone would be like, oh, they're, they're going to come speak, or they're going to be part of this ministry. Oh, that's great, because their grandfather was a Christian. What? Okay. Oh, that's Lex's grandson. Okay, great. That's great. Lex loved Jesus, but what about this? What about this guy? Doesn't mean, yeah, he maybe has a better chance of loving Jesus, but doesn't mean he does. And this is, I think, not a, this is not a great way to be viewing life, which is, was his father okay? And at this point, this is one of the loudest parts that is muted in the text. Are you tracking me here real quick? The loudest part that's muted, meaning it screams what happened to Joseph throughout the Gospels, right? It's just so obvious that Joseph is not there and doesn't say, we don't know, did he die? Was he so ashamed of the upbringing because Jesus was born out of wedlock that he was like, I'm out, dude, I can't do this. And he's out. We don't know. We don't know. And so I don't want to speculate, but it's, we're meant to see that there's the, it's there. I think we're meant to see it's there because really the identity of Jesus is that he's the son of God, that God is his true father, not Joseph. So they're taking him back. And some of us will live, will live in that lie. Hey, God's calling me. Oh, but you're identifying me. You're labeling me as this failure or this inadequate or I don't have the skill. So therefore that's probably true. And then we don't walk in our calling because we're believing what people are saying about us, even though it's not what God's called us. And so Jesus said to them, so they're loving Jesus. Now here's, a, here's, a t here's some advice to Jesus, okay? Advice to Jesus time. If people are liking you, just stay there. That's where, if people like what you say, great. There's no need to say more. And Jesus is like, yeah, but I care about them and love them. We're going to say the truth and then they're not going to like it. So now, no doubt you will quote this proverb to me, physician. See here, they've done it again. He's not the Savior or the Son of God or the Messiah. It's, hey, doc, this is, you're just some doctor guy. Heal yourself. All the miracles that we heard were done in Capernaum. Do it here in your hometown as well. So they're mocking Jesus. And they say, hey, Jesus, you've done all that here, but why can't you do it here? Now keep in mind, Jesus is going to say, all this grace is going to go out. Blind, people are going to get healed. Fresh starts, new identities. All this is going to start again. Can someone help that lady in? She's pulling on the wrong door there. Thanks. So she, all this grace is going to go out. And, God, and then they're like, all that grace is going to go over there, but what about right here? And so Jesus says this, this to them. But he said, truly I say to you, no prophet is welcome in his hometown. Probably a lot of people can attest to that. But I say to you in truth, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah when the sky was shut up for three years and six months when a severe famine came over all the land due to their sin. And yet Elijah was sent to none of them. <laughs> There's a lot of people that needed rain. And God's like, yeah, we didn't go to any of those guys. But we did go to Zarephath in the land of Sidon, which is not in Israel or Judah. It's out in the corner. Like, at that time, if you take out like the Europe, which they didn't know about, but it wasn't really accessible, this is the farthest you could go from Jerusalem. This is the end of the world for the Israelites. So God's like, you know, all those people that could have gotten grace, yeah, we didn't do, we, I didn't. 
We didn't send rain. But this one widow got tons of grace. And he says, in case you didn't get it, let me tell you another one. There are many with leprosy in, the, in Israel at the time of Elisha, the prophet. And none of them were cleansed. Only Naaman the Syrian. Now, the, the Syrians actually tried to conquer Israel. They're the bad guys. Let's go save that one guy from Nazi Germany. Let's get him saved. And all this grace. So he, he says, I'm going to have all this grace. And everyone's like, yeah. And he's like, oh, but for those guys. And you're like, what? Our enemies are getting grace? Wait, can you imagine after World War II, you're like, all you guys are going to have to work hard, but anyone who's Japanese or German in Australia will have all their debts erased. Like how? That would be crazy. That would be so triggering. I even saw uh, last week about one of these doctor medical schools saying, hey, next year we're going to be tuition free. So if you're here, we got a lot of donation, some government grants or whatever. I don't even know what country it was in. But said, hey, so they made this announcement at their assembly at the end of the year. So they just graduated. Next year, who's ever coming back free tuition? My first thought is, what? That's not fair. I'm not even going there. I'm like, what about the poor guy who just graduated? Had to pay all hundreds of thousands. The average doctor comes out with $300,000 worth of debt. And this guy's like, I just worked all that hard. I have all this debt. How come they get it? Because we as Christians, we love receiving grace. But man, we hate it when other people get grace. <laughs> Jesus saved me, but nobody else. And so God's, Jesus is really just showing them who they are. Hey, you are not okay with Jubilee for other people getting it, but me. And I think before we go on to him about to get thrown off a cliff here, I was just really challenged this week with, I think we have this expectation that God gives us grace and we're frustrated when he doesn't. And I get frustrated when other people experience grace and I don't. It's just, I think, part of my sinful nature. And yesterday we were going to get some takeout. It's a very long story, but I'll sh shorten all the parts that we failed. It was my wife's birthday this week and we tried like three times to go to different restaurants for her birthday. They were closed or they were full. And, and I did my due diligence. Like I called and I'll, I looked at the website, but anyway, it doesn't work. So finally it was like, all right, we'll try again tomorrow after church. So we're going for her birthday lunch after church today. God willing, we get there and it's still open. Um, but so she didn't have to cook. I was like, hey, I'll go get takeout. We'll go to Hungry Jack's. So go there, order this, the family bundle, and I'm like, and I also need two extra medium fries, please. Because we got a lot of people in the family. Go there, get the order, go home, pull out the food to everybody, and I have everything except the two medium fries. I am not happy. This is tw not even 24 hours ago, guys, okay? It's not like I can say, hey, I've really grown since 10 years ago when I admit my sin. This is right now. I am fuming. Because I got two people that don't have fries and you got little kids and they're like, but I want fries so someone will have to go without. And you're trying to, it's just complicated, okay? It's just complicated. So I'm like, no. Nah. A month ago, we went to Hungry Jackson. and they did the same thing. Not going to stand for it now. Stand up firm. Go. I'm anointed to go proclaim judgment. And so I go to, I'm on the car back to Hungry, Hungry Jacks again. Second, I'm walking. I'm like, hey, dude, we got, I got a bone to pick with you. You know, it's this poor 16-year-old kid in there. He doesn't even know what he's doing, right? And it's not his fault. Well, maybe it's his fault, but anyway, so I'm just kind of upset. I get the food, go back, and I'm just driving about, I deserve this. I shouldn't have to. Now my food's, when I get home, my food's cold. I missed out on the family dinner, and I'm just like sucking super hard at it. And as I'm, I pull into the driveway, and there's this massive rainbow across the sky. Did you guys see that yesterday? This huge, it was the whole sky. And there's another one on top of it. We had this double rainbow thing. My wife's out there taking a picture, and I just kind of, it was like, God's like, I'm never going to destroy humanity again. And Kevin's like, but I want my two fries. <laughs> like God's like, I've given all this grace. I'm like, but I want my medium fries. And I was just very convicted, like, okay, Kevin, we need to, we need to check, man. Look how much grace God's given me. And I don't have to be upset that the people behind me probably got two extra medium fries on their way home. It's okay. Because God saved me. Like, let's put it in perspective. Look what God's doing. And he's, just because he's giving grace to other people and it seems like he's not giving to me sometimes, that's okay because he still deeply loves me. And he still has a plan for me. And 
And even when things aren't going my way, it's actually for my benefit so I can grow. So I can sit there and be like, you know what, God? It is pretty cool. You're never going to flood the whole world again. I'll take that. That's awesome. So I just want to encourage you to, to, to be thinking as Jesus thinks through the gospel that it's not a right. I don't deserve to be saved. I don't have this belonging that I have to get this certain stuff. But because of the God's grace, I actually get to live a full life, a joyful life, a peaceful life. And so all the people in the synagogue were filled with rage. Talk about a mood swing. We love this guy. He's all gracious words, talking good about him. <sighs> Anyone seen Dude Perfect and the Rage Monster? Okay, that didn't land. Okay, everyone who's 25 and under, you've seen it, right? The Rage Monster just, he's a Christian guy too, but he pretends to, just, oh, he's destroying everything, goes Hulk mode. This is, they are so mad. You're from this town and you're going to help all them and you're not going to help us? And so they want to kill the guy. <laughs> this is his first ministry we have recorded in Luke. We got lots more chapters. In fact, there's, Luke wrote more of the Bible than anybody else in the New Testament, more than Paul did. And so he's got a lot more to say. And so they heard, raised at, as they heard these things. And they got up, drove him out of the city and brought him to the crest of the hill on which their city had been built. So the whole city's here. He's being backed up in a corner so that they could throw him down from the cliff. These are the church people, by the way, okay? These are the people that showed up that day. Sometimes you're going to be put in a really hard place when you will follow Jesus. And what do we do when the people are about ready to throw us off the cliff? What does Jesus do here? Some of y'all may know the story. Some of you know, this is wild. This is insane. This is to me, I don't even know what to say. It's just so crazy and so profound. But he passed through their midst and went on his way. What? <laughs> There's a mob of people around him trying to throw him off the cliff. He's like, thanks guys. Had a great time. By the way, I'll see you next year. But anyway, I'm on my way. I got to go to Galilee here. And he, he just walks through. How does he do that? Because he's Jesus. He has all authority and all power. And it's not his time. He will die and he will give up his life for the sins of the world. But God has a time. And I love that we can trust in the authority of God. You may not get the promotion you want. You may not get all that you think you deserve. You may feel like people are pressing around and making your life hard. And Jesus says, you don't have to kill them. You don't have to try and argue with them. Just walk through to the other side. Walk in. The Spirit of God is upon you. The anointing is on you. God has a calling on your life. And the world may not like it. They may not get it. But if God has a calling on your life, He will fulfill it. Because it's what He does. He's in control. And it's his timing. And he passed through their midst and went on his way. How crazy is that? I hope you walk away thinking how great Jesus is. This is your savior. And no one's getting in his way. No one's stopping his agenda. I love that he even allowed them to get that far. Like he could have been like after, after the, the church service, he could have been like, I, I kind of can see the future and what this leads. I'm just going to leave now. Thanks, guys. No, he let them do all that pressing. And he's like, now when I'm backed against the wall, when it seems impossible... Yeah, now I'm going to exercise my authority and my ability, and I'm going to walk. He has the authority to save you. He has the ability to save you. And thank goodness he loves you. He wants to do that. And so he, it ends here saying, and he came down, wait, is this how it's, and he came down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and he was teaching them on the Sabbath. And they were amazed at his teaching because his message was delivered with authority. So he just goes to the next town, does it again. See, if this was me, if I had preached one Sunday and all you guys were like, let's kill him, throw him off the bridge, I'd be like, you know where I'm not going to go? I'm going to pick a different job. I'm not going to church anymore. <laughs> and so people are like this. They're so burnt, so hurt by the church that they give up on God altogether. Jesus like, this is why you have to know the Spirit is upon you, that you're anointed, that he is sending you. Because when trials and tribulations come, when you know what God's called you to do, then you have the courage and the strength to stay in that lane and keep going. 
when times get hard. And he shows up next week, another time, he's like, guys, I want to tell you the good news. I want to tell you about Jubilee, that I'm the Jubilee. And they were amazed at his teaching and his message was delivered with authority. Jesus has ultimate authority. So let's surrender our lives to him. Let's trust him. Let's follow him. There's no one else worth following. I've asked the J-dubs. They don't, Jesus is the only one worth following. Let's go after him and his authority and his ability. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for today. And I thank you for this awesome story, Lord, where no one's going to stop your plan. And I thank you in light of that. You're not even trying to be the superhero in the story. You just are. You demand that authority and respect, whether we want to give it or not. It's just the world calls for it. The whole universe is praising your name. It all points to you. And Lord, I pray that you can receive the glory we want to give you today. I thank you, Lord, that each person here who has put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ has the Holy Spirit within them to bring bold, a passion and a boldness to whatever you call them to do. You've anointed them for such a time as this to do your work, and you have sent them out into the world, into their families and their schools and their jobs and wherever area it is that you, they have influence and the, the gospel is going with them. The spirit of God is going with them to impact the world, to save the world, a world that's dying and lost. Lord, there's no other message the world needs than that Jubilee is here. Fresh starts can happen right now. The, the sin debt has been paid that the blind can see again spiritually. Lord, you, you're resetting life. And Lord, we thank you that you're a God of second chances and third chances, and fourth chances, and so on and so on. I pray you'll be with us, empower us as we go about our life this next week. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.